Well, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. First, yeah. Thanks, thanks for having me on Parallax. And I actually, I, I I'm, I'm always, uh, I'm always tuning into the Parallax podcast. So I appreciate the dialogue you guys have um, been building. And and um, yeah. So I was, we were just talking about you know what what my primary concern is, and and I'm, certainly I'm not, uh, you know, it was it was spawned by that question of should I read in the original German or should I read in the original French or something like that? Or, or for that matter, the original Greek, you know, it's, it's an interesting question because in the history of philosophy, it does seem like there are these um, cultural centers, which um, come to dominate uh, the, the philosophical scene. I mean, Greece, Germany, and France uh, um, are the, probably the most notable among them in the Western tradition. Um. And I think there's obviously a place for that. And not only is there a place for that, I mean, there literally is a place for that in, in contemporary universities. I mean, there are many professors who specialize in that, um, in that way. Um, and I think that's fantastic. I think my, my personal aim is, is a, with philosophy is a little different. Um, and I also come from, I come to philosophy rather um, as an outsider, I mean, I, I never uh, took a philosophy class in uh, university uh, at any level. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I suppose you'd call it an autodidact. I just um, found myself in need of studying what I saw to be the greatest minds of the modern world. And they were, ha I mean, most of them concentrate in some way, uh, are, are related in some way to philosophy. Um, and it's not so much that I think it's irrelevant to study like those thinkers in their native language as I'm trying to um, go into the densest text and extract from the densest text uh, a comprehensive overview that that can potentially um, raise the dialogue of what you might call the culture wars. Hmm. Let, uh, let, let me ask you something. So, so <clears throat> because I was thinking about what we could talk about and so so if you because you you're a prolific writer and you know you, you do a lot of stuff you have this philosophy portal you just published a new book and so what i know from personal experience that there's always something i mean i think you can call it anstoß from fichte you know this uh, impetus that brings everything into into motion right and so if i think about myself there's always you know that that one thing that one meme that one Thing that propels my thinking over the years in certain directions right i know what it is you know i wonder what what's yours is you know so what is the impetus that the, the original question let's say yeah i always say that it's 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 like one question that split into two um so the 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 original question was basically when I was 19 years old or 18 years old, and I was just in a certain um, perplexity or awe or wonder at how strange human beings are. Um, it just sort of hit me like a ton of bricks. Um, there were several moments just, and that, 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 that line of thinking just stayed with me, you know, and specifically like that, that state of being um, led me to write like this, It wasn't for a class or anything, but I just wrote this paper um, on um, predicting how many other intelligent technological civilizations there might be in the in the universe. And I came to some certain I was trying to do some calculation about it because <laughs> I was because I was I was like uh, I was like, we're so weird and there's no and I was like in evolutionary history, there's nothing like a civilization, right? There's not like a dinosaur civilization, like where one species of dinosaur started to use language and technology and build, you know, sky, skyscrapers or whatever, or go to the moon or whatever. Um, and, and so that anomaly of the human condition and specifically the anomaly of the human condition at in the 21st century, let's say, where there's this certain technological acceleration, which seems so disproportionate in time scale to um, cosmological phenomena. Like I was always blown away that like we could go from a horse and buggy civilization to like a singularity civilization in like two centuries in like a very short time window where like when you look at phenomena on cosmological timescales, you're looking at like 
billions of years for anything to happen meaningfully, right? So there's just like, what's this condensed compression of phenomena and acceleration and complexity? Um, and, and, and that just sort of, um, you know, uh, blew my mind. And so the first like question with that was like, practically being focused on the difference between humans and great apes. I was also interested in the difference between like humans and life, but practically it organized around the question of humans and great apes. And that, that organized my thinking for a while. And um, at least in school. And then in the evenings, it would be more um, exploring blogs related to the technological singularity. So it was more future oriented than a uh, past oriented. And then, so it basically flipped from what's the difference between humans and great apes to what is the consequence of that difference for the future? Um, so, you know, like when I was doing the humans and great apes things, it was like, you know, focusing on the origin of culture, the origin of language, the origin of tool use, the origin of self-consciousness. And then with the technological singularity focus, it became more the future of those things, but also the potential of a qualitative transition to a, a, a different and like an evolutionary transition to a different type of world. Um, and, and in, I mean, I'm still interested. I mean, those, those things are still um, front and center in my mind. It's just that now I'm, trying to approach those dimensions from a philosophical angle as opposed to an evolutionary angle i'd say right so i i had a couple thoughts while you were speaking one is like also to come back to what you were saying before about the culture wars uh and why that is particularly interesting and of course, I, we were also here today to talk a little bit about your new uh, collection, uh, uh, your book, um, which is a collection that you put together of several artists, you know, in, in, or several writers, including my, myself, I'm in the book. And uh, I, I, I think that what you're doing is completely different. Uh, and at the same time, very relevant is that you're publishing your own works and you're also publishing anthologies and you're pu publishing works of people who get together in a community and create something together which uh which is like i see the culture war happening over here and then this this whole other thing which is kind of transcends the the the, the culture war happening in your space and then in other spaces um so I, maybe that's a few questions kind of mixed together but can you make can you can you riff on any of that? Yeah, I mean, first, I just want to say that when it comes to the anthologies, I'm increasingly wanting to see these as, um, of course, I want to take ownership of the fact that, yeah, I mean, I created Philosophy Portal, this is my project, whatever, own that completely, whatever. But I do want to see the anthologies as Philosophy Portal projects. Uh, first, as opposed to my thing. And but at the same time, there's a transition, there's going to be a transition process where I can like the way I think about it is that I need to get something up and running. And in order to get something up and running, I kind of need to steer the thing or be the center of the thing. But eventually I can dele delineate tasks and it be more like genuinely I don't know, collected or something like that. But I, I want to see the anthologies as as philosophy portal projects first and foremost. And it is kind of like rather than propositionally engaging in arguments online, like, oh, that person said something about this or that that I disagree with, or um, that person did a podcast about this or that that whatever I think is out of pocket or whatever, like rather just create the environment that could potentially raise the discourse higher. Um, and that's the aim, I think, with, with the anthology processes. And there's a lot that goes into the anthology process, which I think is, I think, special, like in the context of my experience at the university anyway, because like the university basically is you go into a class, you have many classes, 
Um, you're not with a group of students through any of those classes. You're on your own path all the way. Um, if you happen to develop your own independent research project, you'll go to a conference and you might submit to a journal. But those conferences are usually quite dead. Yeah. Um, the atmosphere at those conferences are usually quite dead. Then you submit to a journal and you go through a very alienating critical process which has positive benefits for sharpening your intellect, but very few people actually end up engaging your work deeply or reading your work or, or even becoming sort of almost communally embedded in an ongoing dialogue. That doesn't happen very often. Maybe if you're a very, very famous professor, that might happen to you. Um, but with these anthologies, what I'm trying to do is create a, a, cult, a subculture or, or a culture where all of the all of the students who have been through a class together they've studied a common material together they've been through that together then we engage in a conference where you're presenting in front of and you're an audience for your peers essentially because they're people you've moved through the class with um and have had have maybe formed friendships with online and then you go through an anthology process, which has a peer review process where there is a critical dimension to it. But the aim of the peer review process is really to create a communal project where you're included in it. And not only are you included in it, but hopefully uh, there's a lot of internal references where, you know, one person is shouting out this person or one person to say, you know, check out this paper, right? Like, so for example, in my, in one of my final articles, you know, I cite I cite your article and say, you know, Sweeney talks about uh, the hanged man in a way that I like, you know, check out that chapter. Right. So there's there's a lot of internal references, which mm -hmm. which hopefully create this sense of um, thinking together and thinking with. And so and, and then the anthology can be read that way, like for people who really want to dive deeply into what I would call the emerging philosophy portal discourse. Um, you know, um, I, I want to build a culture where people are actually reading each other, engaging with each other, uh, and, uh, and, and what I would call on the philosophical time level, because the philosophical time level is not like, um, it's not social media time level. Right, right, right. right. So not so social like media time level, it's, it's, it's over years you build it. So what's your what's your experience with that? Because ontologies are famously difficult to market and to you know to create a buzz around. I, I remember like 12, 15 years ago, I published a, uh, an ontology on love, right? So the idea was to bring different perspectives on love together. So I had like an article from from Wilbur and Eric Fromm. I even talked to the Vatican and got, got an article of Pope Benedict. And so it was like a really interesting kind of piece with 20 articles with different perspectives on love with high profile people but the but the um, result you know and in a nice hot uh, cover and everything was great but it's it's famously complicated to create some some resonance around these kind of um, ontology, ontology projects what's what's your experience with that Right. I mean, yeah, thanks for that perspective and that experience. Um, you know, it increasingly, I feel like we need to really rethink what a book is. Um, and we need to really rethink, like, how many people really deeply read books? Um, and, and then when someone does deeply read a book, what is the consequence of having deeply read that book? You know, it's, it's not so clear. Um, what I'm thinking with the anthology process is that the book, the anthology has to be connected to a much deeper, um, um, a much deeper set of processes and events. So, for example, having been through a course together, having been through a conference together, um, and then I think deeper into the future, setting up retreat spaces um, where like and where it's mostly it's not focused on like, let's say, for example, bringing a lot of 
like it's great, for example, that there are some higher level names in the liminal web, like Lehman Pascal, Thomas Hamelrick, Andrew Sweeney, uh, Carl Hayden Smith. Uh, there are some names like where people are, you know, like people know their their names, right? And they might pick up the anthology because I want to read what Andrew Sweeney is saying, or I want to read what Lehman Pascal is saying. That I'm sure that will happen. But um, what I really am aimed at with the anthologies is to give the students first and foremost the experience of developing their ideas in a paper. Um, having like really worked, like I was talking to one of the authors in the anthology yesterday, Quinn Whelan, uh, about his um, work that's been, he's been developing for two years now. And I was like, if you stay with this for the next year, if you stay with this for the next two years, by the end, you're going to have three or four really solid papers that you've developed over three or four years. And I told him, that's basically the equivalent of a doctorate. That's a PhD, but yeah. That's a PhD. So you can take those four papers. I'm not going to have exclusive rights to any of the papers that are published through Philosophy Portal Books. You could take those four papers, turn it into your own doctoral thesis, and there you go. You've just done a doctoral thesis, the equivalent of, in terms of the skills you've learned. Right. Um, so, and and then also to, like, but also those anthologies as, as part of the culture is like, I want to bring those to life in like retreats and events. Um, and like, so it's not so much that I'm hoping these anthologies sell like, um, I don't know, like thousands of copies or something. I'm more interested that they become a skeleton or a backbone for a culture uh, that is um, hopefully doing uh, physical online organized events. Uh, and, and that actually the point of them is in the end to what I would call birth philosophical cognition. So the people who have been contributing and building their ideas for years, they, like I give the example of Quinn, they will have um, the chance to publish a thesis or, or you know, take it to the next level. Okay, uh, Andrew, so, I know you want mm -hmm. to say something. Let me just ask I always you want to say question. Something. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Just let me, because I, I, I was thinking about so much and I want to have your opinion because I don't, I think nobody knows what a book is. Nobody knows. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's, that is the type of philosophical question we should be asking is what, what is a book, right? Like philosophers can spend their entire lives writing books. And like the entire academic culture, like a lot of people who have tenured, I mean, what, what they really want to do is they want to write their papers, they want to write their books, you know, myself included. Although my, again, ever since I started publishing books, especially when I published my doctoral thesis, and it just sort of was like, like I spent six years writing this thing. And then I, I was thinking when this is published, you know, something will happen, you know, like someone will read it and recognize it and something, something will move. But then you just publish it, nothing happens, no one responds, no one reaches out, no one gives a shit. And then so when I was writing Sex, Masculinity and God with, the, with Kevin Oros and Daniel Dick, what really made that book come to life was using the book in a men's circle. Or what really made the book come to life was talking about the book at the European men's gathering uh, with Manifesto. That made the book come to life. And mm -hmm. that was rewarding. Um, when it comes to um, the anthologies, again, I'm hoping that it serves some sort of physical embodiment retreat or something. So what is it? Yeah, what is a book? I mean, I think a book, I I've been reflecting a lot recently about how a few dimensions, and then I'll, I'll pass it on, is <clears throat> there are certainly things that you, there are certainly things that you, you can't say anywhere except a book. Like, I don't think, po like, podcasting can't replace writing. Uh, podcasting can't replace writing a book. And also the experience and the emotion of going through writing a book is something that is much different than just, say, like, posting a blog on Substack or something like that. Like, there is, so, I, 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 on the one hand, I'm very much in the energy of defending the idea of the book. Um, and also the type of people that we need to encourage to keep writing books, because I think even in like these online liminal spaces, um, 
a lot of the thought leaders haven't written books actually. Right. So, and I think that that's important. I think that the thought leaders of a certain community should have their ideas open and available in book format, like, and, and, and take a stand on, 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 on a certain, certain issues, so to speak. Um, and then the downside of the book is that we also shouldn't think about the book, I think, abstracted from, let's say, community processes, which are, are really thought through, you know, developmentally and generationally, ideally. That's, that's great. Uh, you know, I, I was thinking a few things when you were speaking. Um, I guess the difference between the anthology is that Tom gathered a bunch of authors together and, and published it. Whereas what you're doing is you're 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 all of these different, you know, uh, writers are are working with each other. So so there's a community aspect to that, which is which is, and then there's and then there's actual events where these people meet. Whereas in an anthology. You know, none of these people are famous and they don't meet, <laughs> right? Whereas this is a this is almost like a, a remedy to the alienation of university uh, because I teach at university and universities are the most alienated places, you know, ever. Really, they're they're pure alienation. I mean, the students are in pain, <laughs> you know, and teaching is a painful process there for sure. So so I've also been thinking about like you know how to change that or how to make that how to make the experience more concentrated and more meaningful in all of its different aspects. Right. Uh, so, so I, you know, I go and do my day job and then, you know, and then, and then I'm, I'm, I'm working in my, on my, in, in my own realm about how to, how to, how to do that. How, and, and I think a book, yes, has to be in the context, in a context, you know, and all great books are sort of, they come out of a context of, of living relationships with people, or, you know, working with each other. So, so there's not this author and there might be James Joyce, but, you know, he was also engaged with so many other other people, on, you know, in a, in a physical in a physical space. And so so, um, yeah. And just the, the question I have then is I, I had I want to want to share just a, a quick experience I had the other day. I was I, I was preparing a course for university uh -huh, uh, that I'm going to teach. And I had to create a kind of a technical document. Uh -huh. And uh, to create this technical document, um, first of all, I went to this program which creates a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation in about 30 seconds using artificial intelligence. And so this, it looks pretty good. You got this pres huge presentation that could be created in 30 seconds. And then I wrote my really boring kind of like technical document that I had to write for this class. And I said, what if I just put that in ChatGPT and write it? And it did a much better job than than I could do. And, and it, it was it was painless. And there you go. It was it was right there. I had a, a nice professional document and I didn't have to go through all the, 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 the suffering and pain of writing boring technical shit. <laughs> um, so this is terrible in a way and wonderful in another. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about what to do with that. And my reaction lately is I haven't used paper, pen and paper for a long time. And, and I'm, I'm trying to think about how to break away from this very technical language that is so easily produced in the artificial uh, language space. So um, um, anyway, so I'm, yeah, maybe the question is about the, the future here and, and where we're going. Yeah, I mean, I think this is something that I, I've been thinking about as well. I mean, I, I remember having a conversation with Thomas Hamelrick for one of the Logic Dialogues, where he was talking to me about his experience with ChatGPT at the university, where he's like, you know, the students can write their essay with ChatGPT, the professors can grade the essays with ChatGPT, and yep. <laughs> we yep. can get rid of the whole process because yeah, it's all gone. Them. It's going to be swept away, huh? right? So, but that that's it's it's some in, in some sense it's it's like a perfect uh, dialectical synthesis because both of the processes just fall away. Like the students writing them fall away, the teachers grading them falls away, and then something new happens. Um, and what is that something new? What does that look like? Um, and I think that for me, like with the anthologies and like, let me first start with like how I engage with it in, and I guess try to teach it is, is like writing has to be connected to the, 
to the drive of the heart. If writing is connected to the drive of the heart, then it's something which is communicating and constantly in a sort of experiential process with your intellectual becoming. And I think that is much more difficult to automate or to replicate with artificial intelligence. Um, like you can do technical papers, like I could put in like, you know, what does, what does Zizek think about? Well, Mark? that's why it was a liberation in a sense, because I didn't have to write this bullshit thing. I could, exactly. I could, I could work on the actual content of the course. Right. Yeah. So there, there is a liberation because a lot of the things that the institutions do can be automated. But then the question is like, what is the post-institutional projects that we can engage in or you know, which are more, I would call liminal web dynamic spaces, which I'm, I'm constantly trying to think the conceptual technical details of how the liminal web and the liminal network should should work and what what the, what's what functions they should serve beyond the institutions. Um, and I think that like what I at least encourage all of the. Um, the and what I see in the, in the students process is that it's it's you're not writing like none of the students are writing these things for a grade. None of the students are writing these things because they're going to get a diploma at the end of this. I can't offer a diploma. I, I'm not grading you. Uh, but what is happening is that people are using these opportunities to cultivate the, the heart of their intellect. Uh, they're building their, they're building their capacity to, think their life process. Um, and I think, I think that's what, um, you know, that's at least, it seems to me the way to go. I, I don't, that, that's, the, and that, that is anyway, the way I'm trying to, to build it. And we'll see if that becomes threatened by artificial intelligence at some point, but at least now I think that it's, it's not threatened by artificial intelligence. Well, I think that's the original meaning of humanities, right? Isn't it? I mean, writing an essay is to try to answer a question, you know, an existential question. So the whole process should return to a real existentiality, you know, as you say, the drive of the heart, uh, rather than, um, you know, it's become a simulacrum and, and everybody knows it's corrupt and everybody knows it's rotten, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty hollowed out. Um, and I guess it, 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 it's just getting hollower from everything. I'm, I'm not in the universities anymore, but everything I hear points in the direction of it becoming hollower. Um, and, you know, I, I think that that just precisely just shifts the, the, I'd say the burden of responsibility on whatever our various networks are up to that we are, um, trying to create and birth spaces that can um, keep the intellect alive and keep the spirit alive and keep the heart alive and, and keep um, meaningful creative projects uh, going out, you know, at beyond their, uh, beyond their constraints. And there'll be new constraints, but. Yeah. And there seems to be a shape to how it's occurring as well. There seems to be like, when you talk about something, you know, I can I can relate it to what I'm working on and what we're working on in Parallax. And there seems to be a sort of people are simultaneously like there's a symbiotic intelligence at work and people are simultaneously doing working in the same realm, you know, and you each has a unique quality. But 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 there's something, uh, you know, perennial down there that needs to be kind of, you know, discovered and uh, I, I think it's 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 almost I, I would put it in you would put it in the philosophical realm and I I, I would I want almost say it's religious as well. Hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, this is this is a conversation that's coming up more and more. Again, I would uh, the way I, I guess the way I and I'm and I'm always looking for for ways to think about this differently. But uh, I, I like the triad between um, philosophy, religion, and art that philosophy like that and so there is some sort of absolute triad between philosophy religion and art and we have to understand sort of you know where our identities are primarily operating you know am i primarily in the philosophical space am i primarily in the religious space am i prim primarily in the artistic space and then 
if I'm primarily in one of those spaces, what does it mean for me to engage with a, another realm? Yeah. Um, or the place in between. We were just talking last time about or the in -between. spandrels in between these different spheres of engagement. And, and so I, I find this in-between space also very interesting because it's, it's unstructured. It's a place of enormous creativity, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So like, I think no matter where we find ourselves, if we do find ourselves in one of those areas or another, I think that inevitably you're also in the in-between spaces. And um, yeah, those are where you'll get probably the most uh, creative energy is. What does it look like to combine a philosophy, someone who's specializing in philosophy, someone who's specializing in art, someone who's specializing in religion? What does it look like to combine your forces, uh, be willing right. to enter that in-between space and, and create something that you can't create just by yourself? Yeah. And it's also a question of degrees, too, like uh, the in-betweens and degrees, like, you know, uh, on, so you have your primary, let's say, archetype or your primary drive or your primary, the thing that is, is really your thing. But that is dependent on the other things as well that doesn't exist in isolation like philosophy needs religion and and which needs art and they, there's an interdependency in, in the whole in the whole in the whole ecosystem even though we have our primary thing uh, interesting like uh, you know i study the gurchev work and and gurchev's original you know philosophy was based on these centers you know heart body and mind uh he called them the three brains um but then later he talked about the importance of developing the in-betweens is even more vital than, than developing those actual centers. So the focus is on the is on the relationship between the centers uh, as much as it is in focusing on, on, on the uh, on the primary the primary center. Yeah, I mean, like you could apply that those categories of the heart, body and mind to what we were just talking about yeah. with like, what is a book and like, what is what do we do with writing after chat GPT, for example, is that, you know, maybe chat GPT uh, is the revelation that all of the writing going on in universities is not fully thought through the heart, body and mind triad, for example. Mm -hmm. indeed yeah yeah and that well yeah it's a reflection it's not like it's a it's a autonomous thing that's happening it's a reflection of the emptiness right of the whole and the mechanicalness of the whole of the whole of the whole project because you know i was thinking about this like students were already writing chat gpt style essays before chat gpt was invented in other words they were trying to cobble together a bunch of cliches in order to you know impress the professor in, in some kind of a way rather than you know ask this existential question which is what an essay is for like what the fuck are we doing in the matrix and how do we get out of it <laughs> or whatever right well I, I remember when i was a master's student and i was looking to make a lot of ex i was looking to make some extra cash um that there was a market for basically ghostwriting like Students would students would pay graduate students to ghostwrite their their first year uh, essay or something like that. Oh, of course, yeah. Right? So, yeah. So I mean, that just means that people are not there to really go to dig deep and to to discover some um, truth about their their heart, body, and mind. There, they're there to get a grade that will potentially get them a degree, which will be able to um help them adapt to a neo neoliberal landscape where they can eventually retire fat and happy at 65. so is that the the theme of the ontology itself i mean you, you talk about spiritual leadership via nietzsche i don't know exactly the title but you know that's that's the idea of the ontology isn't it and so is that the is that the the driving idea behind that well the, so the the driving idea came from um, so the, the title is Abyssal Arrows, um, Spiritual Leadership Inspired by Thus Spoke Zarathustra. There you go. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, the, the, the idea behind it came from, you know, having read it, not, not only having read it several times, but then I think you have a different perspective on a book when you try to teach it. Because it, it I mean, it, it, in some sense, it puts new pressures and challenges on you to 
to really communicate this in a way that's understandable to other people. And what what came out for me when I was when I was teaching um, Thus Spoke Zarathustra was not only the explicit message of the book, which is, you know, the overman is the meaning of the earth or whatever. Um, but also what seemed to me to be the implicit message of the book, which was Zarathustra's own internal antagonisms and struggles throughout the four parts of the book. Like, it's not like Zarathustra is, uh, you know, perfectly aligned and uh, he's got everything figured out and uh, he just needs to communicate it to, to, to the rabble. It's it's much more it's much more interesting than that. Like he's constantly in a inner war with himself. You know, he's he's struggling with himself. He's 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 confronted with phenomena in his process uh, with, with with let's say his downgoing uh, to humanity, which basically to me point towards uh, the existential and emotional and spiritual um, challenges of becoming a leader. Um, each of the four parts, like I could go through how each of the four parts ends. Um, and when in each of the endings of the four parts, Zarathustra confronts a different antagonism with his capacity to lead. So in the first part, he uh, was struggling with people idolizing him and turning him into a fixed statue. For example, at the end of the at the at the end of the speeches of Zarathustra. At the end of the second part, um, he is ashamed of his capacity to lead. He he doesn't want to own the fact that he's leading something, and he has to go deeper into withdrawal. In the at the end of the third part, he's confronting the fact that he actually doesn't love life as much as he says he loves life. Um, and that he is not prepared yet to really sacrifice himself. Um, and ultimately, he comes to the idea of the sacrifice of the sacrifice, which I love that concept, the, that he even sacrifices the notion of sacrifice. Um, anyway, so he goes through these, these inner struggles with himself on these levels. And I wanted to pull out that implicit message. I wanted to make it more explicit. At least that's sort of like, you know, the angle I was taking with it. And I wanted to encourage other people to think about how um, Zarathustra as a figure, as a fictional character, as a story, as a, as a myth, um, could help us think through leadership dynamics today and, 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 and in the context of spiritual development. And I think that Zarathustra is a useful model to wrestle with in that in that direction. Mm. Yeah, because oh, no, everybody. Sorry, go ahead, Andrew. No, no. You, you, well, I was going to say that leadership. Uh, yeah, it's this. It, it is in itself a struggle between inflation and deflation, and all of these like and the ego and and and, and everything and and. Um, maybe the the uh if we, if we took zarathustra at, at face value it, it would seem that like this kind of delirium of this person who who is is you know wants to be the superhero of, of but 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 there's the, this aspect of i think tragedy within it which makes it so much deeper and more complex anyway that's what i was thinking the tragic element and uh, the sacrifice of the sacrifice that's an interesting concept because I guess the the notion of leadership is oh you're supposed to sacrifice and become humble and serve the people, right? But that's that's an insufficient uh, that's an insufficient notion of of, of, of leadership. <laughs> I don't even I don't know how to go even further than that. But but what do you mean with with leadership? Because what you don't want is that everybody strives to leadership position because that's absurd, right? And so what do you mean with leadership? Yeah, because I mean, like I'm I mean, sorry, because like everybody is like, oh, we need to be, you know, in the leadership, with leadership, and uh, you know, you need, need to do this, and everybody, but not everybody is cut out to be, you know, yeah. a leader or in a leadership position. So there's a, you know, an, another dimension probably to it. There's this tantric group. Somebody, I just this is an aside. Sorry to, before you you, you uh, respond, uh, Cadell, but there was uh, this guy was complaining that everybody this was a tantric meeting in sweden everybody in the group was the leader there was no longer any participants because because you know there's this inflation of this idea of being a leader whereas often the leader has this 
doesn't want to be a leader, right, is, is, is going, is really resistant to the idea of, of leading and is, is pushed into it because of, of the, the, the truth or the drive towards the truth. Yeah, a lot of that makes a lot. I mean, yeah, all, all of that actually makes makes sense to me. Um, it, it's 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 certainly not the case that everyone needs to be um, the leader. And in fact, if everyone became a leader, then there would just be a paradox of that word. That word would cease to make sense. Uh, it's almost like uh, I get the uh, the ideas that Alex Ebert often talks about, about the um, the homogenization, creating a flat line. It's like if everyone's a leader, then there's no there's no leaders <laughs> anymore. Right. right. So so we certainly don't need a situation where everyone becomes a leader. But increasingly, at least in the way I'm trying to think through the liminal web dynamics, is that we do need to think about um, people who simply become leaders by taking initiatives on projects. Um, if you take initiative on a project, you know, can you for example, um, as Sweeney was pointing towards um, own, like when he's saying like the leader doesn't want to lead. If you're starting a project, can you own the fact that you are leading something, you are standing for something, you are and, and pr precisely pushed into it by the truth? Yeah. Um, and, and because we can also have people who, who step into leadership positions, but they're, they're not capable to really own the fact that they're in a leadership position. That's, that's also a, a, a problem. Um, and, and indeed, that's something that I think Zarathustra struggles with at a certain part is that precisely that, um, you know, I think he talks about this precisely as operating in the space of the lion and the child um, of, you know, almost being ashamed that he finds himself in a leadership position and not being able to, to really, um, in some sense, uh, joyfully will that process. So. Um, of course, there's complex dynamics. We definitely need to think through dynamics of leadership and followership. We need to think of spaces where in some spaces I might be a leader, in other spaces I might be a follower. You know, how, and so how do I balance both being a leader and a follower in different contexts? Um, all of those things are important conversation. Right, but I mean, also, you know, the, the whole idea, you, you could read... The, the the overman the superman as a metaphor right as something that you do internally like i don't know if you have read peter sloterdijk but he talks about something like a vertical tension that you have right a vertical tension where you, you kind of create a, a unit be between you and the future and you now right and you orient yourself towards something that is not has not been achieved yet a, a fuller version of yourself a more complete a more complete version and 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 the future kind of excels to, you know to to push you into the future and and tries to draw you into the future and these are kind of different uh, similar kind of images you know so you have you have the superman something that is maybe your future you know a more complete um symbol of yourself in the future so and and you know regarding leadership i try to I tried to view it less as a social phenomenon and more what you refer to like as a, you know, as an internal dimension of, you know, you, you, you're, you're leading a project, you're doing something, you're, you're, you're striving into the future. You're, you're on a critical path on, you know, with, with Buckminster Fuller's words. And so, um, that would, hmm? I think, I think like what, what you see in thus spoke Zarathustra is precisely that, the primary inner antagonism with him becoming a leader is more of an internal dynamic, it seems to me. It's something that he struggles with inside himself. Um, and, but at the same time, inside himself, he, he's always in this dialogue with like a, what he calls a voiceless voice, uh, which seems to have a feminine accent onto it. Um, and that's really where he engages this, this implicit narrative of his own uh, struggles and his own process of becoming is in this internal dynamic with this inner other or this extimate other, as I, I would probably like to, like to frame it. And that is indeed um, not like a sitting in stillness, but rather a more of a critical path, um, as you're, you're referencing there, Fuller. 
Um, yeah, and I, I've read I've read Slaughter Dyke, like uh, you must change your life, and the exactly and the, yes, and the mm -hmm. spheres the spheres trilogies. Um, and and yeah, talking about that that vertical tension inside oneself with the with the future. I mean, I think that's almost how um, I spontaneously conceptualized self development when I was a teenager. Was that you want to make decisions in the present which as it were was was holding your entire future potential at that moment and 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 working with that um but that's obviously incredibly difficult for many people to do and and building a culture with that ethos um i, I think we're we're only at the the very early stages of being able to think through what that might look like but certainly no, well, well in yes i get what you're saying but in slaughter dykes words that's what's happening all along you know because we are on this kind of auto auto poetic self Uh, creating circles of you know always needing vertical tensions in order to create the society we're living in right now so that's his argument you know and so it's like the question is how 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 aware are you of these processes and how you can use this awareness to let's say ch supercharge that very process yeah that that to me is a very uh a very important um reflective um move to make uh i think that's you know like i could i could talk a little bit about how i've related to that through my life but maybe i would just focus on my current project with philosophy portal is i remember the day when i had the image in my mind of what philosophy portal might be but it's one thing to have that immediate idea uh and it's another thing to actualize it and i think that in order to actualize it you do have to be this self-creating circle and you have to become increasingly aware of um you know at the same time the supercharged image of what what the thing could be while at the same time navigating a whole bunch of practical complex dynamics which are constantly requiring you to think new things and um overcome new tensions and hurdles which you could never have anticipated or predicted And so it's it's you know you're constantly you constantly have to think uh, as as you go, right? Yeah, I had a couple thoughts. I was thinking about this great um, yogi in India who was a beggar, and he had thousands of people co come to him. He was this great leader who was simultaneously a beggar, right? So he went to the lowest of the low. He went down the mountain. That's right. And often we 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 imagine success to be going up the mountain but there's a way in which there has to be a really powerful ascent to the bottom i think before that really profound leadership can, can arise otherwise we're just trying to construct something all the time and then also we have to be less attached to our construction so we make something we have to allow it to fall apart in order for a new iteration of that thing to come about uh, so so uh You know, so I, I struggle with that in groups that I, I've done is having to let the thing fall apart in a sense so something something new can arise. Uh, and I think that's important is a leadership need a leader needs to know how to let go of that of something, including his own leadership at certain points, because if you hold too tight to the uh, to the to the position or the power or the the thing, then 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 it becomes it becomes a it becomes too much, it, it, it will fall back down on your head. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a lot in there that I like. Um, what it's making me think about is there was a, a humbling moment for me in my, my process where um, for about 10 years, I was motivated by the, the image of the, the doctorate, like just, a, you know, that was what I was trying to actualize. And in some sense, that was like climbing a mountain. And then, you know, when I finally published the doctorate, I, there was this huge confrontation with impotence, my own impotence, um, you know, like that, that, you know, it's not just you publish the doctorate and again, like all the doors of the world open to you or something like that. Um, it was rather that I had to let that identity go in some sense. I had to, like, I basically started to explore lack. Um, so, you know, I would say my dominant phenomenological experience after the doctorate was like experiences like fasting or abstinence or, or, or meditation or just letting, letting go, uh, shedding that identity um, and, and starting from the beginning again. 
Um, and I do think that, you know, when it comes to our projects, like I'll speak personally about Philosophy Portal, is that I do think you have to build the destruction of the project into the project itself. Right. So like, I, like, and that's something I'm asking myself constantly is at what point will I have to destroy philosophy portal? At what point will I have to let this go? Right. Um, and, and that's, that's something that I'm, I'm still working through, but I do think that it's important to keep that um, dynamic in your mind um, is, you know, you build something, but you're not building something for it to like, I don't know, um, be permanently reified. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, you know, the old English hermetic traditions, you know, in, in their publishing circles, they always said, you know, we have four or five years of, you know, uh, of, of speaking. And then we have four or five years of absolute silence where we, it's like we, where we don't do nothing and where we, you know, try to try to reinstigate the, the circle in you in a kind of sense. And I always liked the idea, you know, to this interplay between, between death and life and and to know i mean as as goethe said everything that is living is worth to be destructed you know and so i i really i really like that mm -hmm. yeah and on the other hand there are th some some pieces of work like we're going back to like you're going back to zarathustra like it m most most of our creations just dissolve into nothingness right you know, you know you know, almost all of our creations and, and all of them will eventually dissolve into nothingness, but some creations kind of endure. So that's interesting. And I, I suppose the ones that endure are the ones that are, uh, I would, I won't say that, that are connected to the archetypes or, or, I mean, that's maybe too Jungian for to say, but they're, they're connected to, um, there, there's something within them that is continually generating. Uh, new insights, you know, you keep reading Shakespeare because there's a continual generation of new insights. Um, but what we have to, what we, ha we, we could never, I don't think we could ever do that unless we were called to do that in some sense. There has to be a prof profound calling. It's not something that anybody can actually, you know, will. So as I was wondering about this notion of will in, in Zarathustra and, and where will comes from and does it come from behind or is it or do we we will something into into creation. I, I don't know if these things can be fully answered, but they're perhaps best thought of as koans of some sort. No, but let yeah. me. I'm sorry, but let let me just do a wild a wild thing here because we were talking about the Iliad the other day and about. I mean, this is a three thousand year old book, and and this idea of life and death is already embedded in there, like. Uh, like in the first chapter where Achilles has to make the choice between an easy life uh, with family and, and, you know, and, and he will fade, but, or he will, he will go to war and will remember it forever. And he, and he dies at the end. And so, I mean, we were talking about the idea of the book. What an amazing book. The book is older than the fucking Bible. Right. And so we are, and so, and so we, we're talking about these ideas that profoundly shifted our thinking. You know, this, this very question, I mean, you mentioned that you had your, sorry, I tried to bring this all a little bit together. So you mentioned that you had your, your first question with 17, 18 or something like this, you know, it's like, because that's the very age, you know, us young men, you know, men have that question. It's like, what do you do? You know, do you go the easy road, you know, or do you, do you challenge everything? And there might be death, but there might also be glory. You know, and so you, you kind of, you kind of navigate that space and then it's already in that old book. So what is a book? It's like, it's to me, it's like utterly fascinating because it's like, you know what I'm saying? It's, um, because it's like, you can't have Zarathustra and Nietzsche and, and Jesus without that book. Right. Death or glory. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we're certainly participating in something much larger than just any of us as individuals, of course. Right. And, and, you know, when I'm talking about building the destruction of philosophy portal into philosophy portal, I'm at the same time hoping that the books and the creations that come out of philosophy portal outlast me and outlive me and, and have a, an, eff an effect like you're talking about with the Iliad. I mean, I think we should we should strive to leave our mark and I think we should strive to have a, a creative culture, which is, you know, not just mimicking the Greeks or the Germans or the French in, in these philosophical circles that we maybe are influenced by, but 
um, that that we create our own liminal web culture, which 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 produces cultural artifacts of its of it of its own for for our time. Um, and and you know, I mean, I guess in the same way that you know you're invoking the Iliad, and uh, you know it's older than the Bible, and um, you know why not think about books in a way that I'm writing something which I hope to be read two thousand years from now. Um, I, I think that's a much better ga- uh, goal and aim than, uh, for example, uh, engaging in social media dynamics, Twitter, TikTok, which it's just here, it's gone, right? Uh, I, I often said, like, you know, there are some philosophy books which are like tweets which it takes 200 years to actually understand, right? I, I think we should we should have that that type of mind state. And are those um, are those creations that endure? Are they are they connected to to some archetypal reality? I mean, these are these are open questions. I mean, who 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 really knows in the end? But um, certainly, not everything survives that long. And there there are some works which which stand the test of time and and seem to give you a little shine of eternity. And there are some things which are here one second and gone the next. I know it's weird to think that the Iliad, as long as human human race will exist and the humankind, it's like, yeah, the Iliad will always be part of that. You know, that's that's a weird thought. I mean, it's like in the pyramid of things, you you know exactly where a piece of art kind of is, is located. You know, it's like, oh no, it's like uh, the, the Rolling Stones will fade, but John Lennon, he will last. I don't know why that is, but you instinctively know you have this relationship to eternal truth you know what i'm saying it's like nietzsche and and hegel these per- persons will persist you know I, i'm not sure, so sure about shelling you know so it's like you know exactly where you know these kinds of pieces of art and philosophy kind of are located in the grand scheme of things well it's a, it's a tra- transpersonal question in a way yeah. like it's like uh it's like enlightenment right it's like we should have the highest aim i i agree Absolutely, our aim should be a full, full enlightenment. You know that 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 is the aim. You know, and, and if that could be expressed in a piece of art, um, then uh, and that enlightenment doesn't mean some you know final static position or place. It means it means uh, you know a dynamic uh, eternity of the the f- a fountain of of constant you know expression. Yeah, I mean, I think that's it, right? Like, I mean, ultimately, yeah, what I'm what I'm writing about now is actually kind of related to that idea of enlightenment being this constant fountain of, of expression, is that that's really the source, at least for me, I think that's what I would call the source is just that capacity to continually um, revive and renew oneself uh, and, and to be this sort of source of creative drive um and so no matter what it is that comes out of that creative drive whether it's like for example parallax or philosophy portal or whatever is that those things are never the thing the thing is this source of this wellspring of creativity which you know parallax and philosophy portal can rise and fall as they'll naturally whatever their natural goal is or whatever their natural consequence is in the world. But we have to keep in touch with that, that source, that, that, that ever becoming creative uh, drive. And, 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 and to have some sort of, I do think it's important to like cultivate some sort of continuity with that retroactively. Like for example, you know, I start this podcast by talking about a reflection I had when I was 17 or 18 years old. And there is a con- even though I've had projects which rise and fall in that time. Um, there is a continuity in that intellectual process, which is, I think, integral. Beautiful. Mm. Yeah, there's a there's an original inspiration, right, that we all have maybe in our lives, right? Something that there's just a moment or a or a or a flash which lays out the whole path for us in a way we don't really know it at the time, but you can go back and look and say that was the moment that laid out the whole path you know and then i've diverted from that path and fallen out of it and then come back to it and you know we always fall out of the path until until we f- we're fully on it you know so we're fully yeah, there's, a term, 
Dora and fully so, on the chariot of Makerva, or what you know, to use Jewish mystical language, we're, we're on the chariot of, you know, constant create creativity. There's in systems theory, there's a term called systems drift, you know, so systems kind of iterate in time in, in certain directions and and so but they have an impetus you know and so but you know it you know the drift is already there with the impetus and i like that idea so it's like you you do these things but the impetus stays there and you you iterate and you try and you fail and you do something new and yeah. by that way you're becoming who, who you're supposed to be yeah the falling out is also part of the arriving at the same time uh in a sense. Hmm. Anyhow. So what did you want to do? You, so perhaps we're, in, we're heading towards a conclusion. Cadell, do you want to just give our listeners, a, 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 you know, you know, a, a bit of a, you know, tell tell them what you're up to and, and, and where you're going from here and how they can, you know, be in touch with you or, or get involved in all of these things? For sure, yeah. Um, well, yeah, Abyssal Arrows was just released. Um, it's seven hundred. It's about 750 pages. I think there's 28 contributors. So it's a real, it's a real beast. Um, that, that must have been a lot of work. A it, lot of yeah. work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I edited it. <laughs> You're a beast of work. I yeah. mean, from an observation, like, fuck, I don't know. How, so, how, so. I, re I mean, I recommend you can find that on philosophyportal.online. There's a link to the Amazon link. You can, you can get it as a Kindle. You can get it as a physical book. Um, there are many strategically organized themes throughout the book where there are certain chapters uh, where authors are in, in, in deep engagement with each other. Um, I think that this is more than just a it's This is not a description of Thus Spoke Zarathustra. It's a living engagement with the spirit of Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Um, and so if that's something that, that interests you, and, and increasingly I hear that even in the universities, they've never really known what to do with Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Like, like it's like a weird part of Nietzsche's uh, bibliography. And that makes sense to me because Thus Spoke Zarathustra is a very, it, well, one, it's a, it's a fictional work. Uh, which is seen as a philosophical form, which is very strange. Um, and, and that's, I guess, one of the reasons why I wanted to, to build a class around it and into, to engage with it, because I do think that it's important to create a link between philosophy and literature, um, reality and fiction, and the ways in which these bleed into each other. So um, Abyssal Arrows is, is an embodiment of that, so I, I would recommend picking that up. Um, if you want to learn more about my work and where I'm going, um, just go to philosophyportal.online. The next big project is, uh, well, one, there's a Science of Logic conference on June 24th and 25th. Um, really excited for that. We've got some, some great headliners. Peter Shostead Hughes will be presenting. Peter Rollins will be presenting. We've got, you know, more familiar faces to many of you. You'll have... Layman Pascal, Thomas Hamelrick, Daniel Garner, Alex Ebert, Bruce Alderman, you know, the, the gang's all there. So check out that conference. You just need to go to the conference page and register. Um, then uh, my next big class is going to be on Lacan's Cree, which starts September 3rd. Um, we have four guest instructors for that class. Um, Peter Rollins, Isabel Millar, Richard Boothby, and Todd McGowan. And what we're really going to be trying to do with that class is connect psychoanalysis to problems of politics, religion, um, uh, and society. Um, and really, I think that's where my mind is, is not just sort of like what is psychoanalysis, but what is the meaning of psychoanalysis for social interpretation, uh, political interpretation, um, religious even interpretation in, in more that direction. Um, so yeah, and so that course can be found on philosophyportal.online and uh, reach out to me if there's any questions about getting involved in those processes.